But I went in there, 2 in the morning, got up to the door and it said closed, 12, you know, midnight. I said, well, you know, Christians are funny people, maybe. And I pulled on the door, it opened. I went inside, there's one guy in there, toolbox out and things, bent over trying to fix this coke fountain. See, the coke fountain had broke just about the time they were going to close, and he decided to stay behind and fix it. That's the way the Lord has to treat some Christians. He has to break things in their lives to keep them in one place long enough to do his will. But he stayed there, and I walked in. I, he looked up and says, oh, can I help you? And I said, yeah. He looked at me and says, yeah, I think you need some help. And he had to see me. I was with some brothers the other day, and one of the girls that I used to live with in witchcraft walked right by the car and looked right in the car and didn't even recognize me. Now, that's what I mean. When the Lord changes you, I believe he changes you. And I walked in, I sat down, and he started witnessing to me and got nowhere with his witnessing. And finally, I got to the point that I was in witchcraft, you know, I told him about it. After he caught his breath about 20 times, he picked up the phone and called the pastor. It was only 3 in the morning. And you know that would be very weird. Nobody ever calls the pastor for prayer at 3 in the morning. <laughs> so he called the pastor and he explained. He says, oh, that, yeah, that's Lance Collins. We've been praying for him a while. You know, and they started acting, I think, the way that they must have acted when they prayed Peter out of jail. He arrived at the door. They couldn't believe that it was taking place. So they, he said, well, I'll call up a bunch of people and I'll pray. we'll start praying for him. You go back and you witness. He witnessed some more and it wasn't getting anywhere. He was doing the standard witness and it just wasn't reaching me. I just wasn't receiving what he was saying. And finally, he stopped and he said, Lord, give me discernment in this matter. Give me knowledge. Give me a scripture of your word that will do something that will break the devil's hold on this man. I heard the prayer. Oh, boy, this guy's weird. Here he goes talking about the devil again. And he got 2 Timothy 1.7. And he opened it and he read it to me. And I gave my heart to the Lord. It was too good of a promise to pack up. I spent... All my life, in fact, I guess from the time I was five years old, in a world of absolute, total fear, and and also all the guilt. In fact, my mother, at that very moment, was in a mental hospital. She is so barred out on barbiturates now, even though she's out of the mental hospital, that she doesn't even know who she is most of the time. It's because of the fear and the guilt of the things that she's done. And when he said the Lord would make my mind new, and take away the fear. I said, that's it. Show me now how to get it. And we knelt down and we prayed. And I accepted the Lord. And I said, Jesus, I want your forgiveness. But can you take the guilt and the fear away? And I got up out of there and talked about no fear. I went out there and almost got myself killed because I didn't have any fear. I still don't have the fear today. And if anybody should have a fear, it's somebody that came out of the Illuminati. I don't have the fear today. And that's why we're having our rehabilitation center now. We're trying to take the fear out of people's lives and teach them that Jesus can make them anew. We have a center that we're opening tomorrow. It's very funny. The doors of the center aren't even opened yet, and it's already filled. There's cars coming from the East Coast. In fact, the most second most powerful witch that has ever been saved was just saved last April after I left the East Coast. Her testimony is almost similar to almost everything I've given today about the Rothschilds and the politics and Charles Manson and other things that she knows about. And she's coming out here to go through rehabilitation. I'm going to put her through just as fast as we can and get her out and get some tapes made on her and let the world know there's another nut out there saying the same thing. But we've got, like one girl moved in last night as we were moving the furniture into the place, we moved one for rehabilitation in. And it'll just... This fill up. In fact, we'll probably have to start believing now for another six months for another building. But these buildings are necessary because when a person is saved out of the occult, out of the Illuminati, a contract is placed upon their head where professionals, not amateurs, are looking for them. The summit has some very good professional people. And they'll send them after to kill you. So we try to guard these people and protect them for a period of time so they're able to stand on their own two feet. He said, well, what about me? Why had some loving Christians around that had sense enough to hide me out so I was able to come out of it and was able to stand on my own two feet, know how to protect myself and stay alive and so on. My wife, when she was saved, the same thing was done for her. And now we're believing that hundreds will get saved because the fear will be taken out of their lives. So we ask you to pray about it with us. And right now, this car is going to be leaving in a little while from come across several thousand miles from Maryland to California. About three, four people that have been saved out of the occult will be in the car along with bodyguards. They may seem to think that's kind of funny. 
Except there'll be a hundred thousand people trying to collect the bounties on those kids between here and there. It's not funny at all. It'll be a miracle if they get here. But I serve a God of miracles. And I ask you to pray that that car gets here with all of its occupants in absolute safety, protected by the blood of Jesus. Okay, we're going to go. There's some questions and answers here real quick. I'm sure I probably stirred a few up in your minds. If you'll just lift your hand, a man will walk back with a microphone. Take the question. Back here, the lady in red. Or brown? Yeah, brown. All the way in the back. Lift your hand up high so you can see. My question was, I mean, it's not a question. I know I know what uh, when he was mentioned, uh, uh, revivals and things that saved him. I know they do because my daughter is married to a minister and I was saved and I know what Jesus can take out devils and demons and on revivals and things and people can be saved because I was. Okay, let's stay, let's stay with questions so we can think right here, young man, real quick. Stand up so he can see you because he can't see your hands walking around so much. Could you explain the Rothschilds? The Rothschilds? The Rothschilds are a family. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen the three little globes that hang around the pawn shop as the emblem of a pawn shop. That comes from three acorns off the Rothschilds family crest. They were money lenders to begin with in Austria and they became, which they are now, the largest, the richest family in the world. They are not considered humans by the occult world. They're considered gods. They believe that gods, sons and daughters of Lucifer, dwell in these human bodies. And when the humans die, the Rothschilds die, they go into the next Rothschild born. And they're not to be treated as men. They're to be treated as gods. And believe me, they are treated as gods. Their word is absolute law. That's the Rothschilds. They created, they founded the Illuminati, and they, not, many people can't understand why a family of Rothschilds 200 years ago, it's actually, been, it's actually three because they existed 100 years before their birth date, would create a conspiracy for a takeover that they never hoped to see fulfilled. Well, that's because witches believe in reincarnation. And they believed that they would be alive during that time to see it happen. This may seem funny to your ideas, but when you're raised in it, it's absolute truth to witchcraft people. Right here. Okay. I'm going to use this, yes, just a minute. Um, Friday at, in chapel at school, you said people that were involved in Hollywood and music and things like that were somehow involved in, in witchcraft. Do you mean that they were actual practicing witches to be popular today, or did they just have to go along with it? And also, does that include things like all forms of entertainment, such as um, different parts of the country, country music and Broadway and New York and things like that? Well, <clears throat> there's a scattering of it through country music. I guess probably the leader of it in country music is a man named Tom T. Hall. But uh, in rock music, you must be an initiated witch, a coven member. That means you're a minister, okay? To be, and anybody in the last two years that's come on television must be an initiated witch. Three of the major soap operas on TV have now made it a fact that to be a member of their staff, their television, you know, actors and actresses, on these three major soap operas, you must bear the scar of initiation to be on. Okay? That's why the leading one, the young and restless, is so popular. Okay? Now, that's, if you, any of the new shows coming on, you can just check them off. Those people belong to a witchcraft or Satan's brotherhood somewhere or they wouldn't be there. Okay? And eventually they'll get all the older ones out that got in there, do different things you had to do back. You've always had to do something. You're not on television or in the movies because you're good. You're there because you paid a price, whatever the producer wanted from you. Now, it's witchcraft. In the early 70s and late 60s, it was homosexuality. And before that, it was the producer's couch and so on. Okay? But now it's witchcraft. All right? Uh, Yeah, two things. Uh, First off, you were talking about the Rothschilds. There is a book that I just read I'd like to recommend to anyone who's interested in the international banking. It's called None Dare Call It Conspiracy. And that really explains it in the context of what's happening in the world today. And secondly, I would like to know about the witchcraft. What about these uh, cults, the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the Mormons, uh, stuff like that? Can you tell tell us what influence that? Well, the closest to witchcraft 
is the Mormons, because their Bible so resembles passages from the Book of Shadows, but, which is the witchcraft Bible. But, see, here's the thing about the cults and so on. We, we have a mailing list, I mean a post office box where people write in, communicate with. There are so many thousands of cults, and most of them go to the skies of Christian churches today that are teaching this ver- variation from the Word of God and this variation and so on. And the thing here is that I firmly believe is there's one way to the Lord Jesus Christ, or to the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ in Calvary. That's the only way, through repentance, through a born-again experience. But with the devil, there's always but one. And all these cults are to serve one purpose, to keep your eyes off of Calvary, the only way to make it. And that's why all the television and all the literature out today is so down on the Christians for only one reason. That they try to say they're the only way. They're not saying they're the only way. The Lord Jesus Christ is saying he's the only way. And they try and put you down because you believe that repentance and the blood of Jesus is the only way there. Okay? But it is. And that's why certain well-known ministers today are trying to become popular and say, well, it's possible to make it to heaven other ways. Well, the Bible said there'd be idiots like that in the last days. Yes. The age of Aquarius, you said, was like 1980, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And you said that um, the man called Adam would be the Antichrist in Mm -hmm. whatever... Uh, the covenant or whatever. Well, they believe he'll be the world okay. dictator. Okay, it's getting yeah. pretty close to 1980. Yes, it is. Uh, do you have any idea or, you know, who it might be? Cause his name was most... mentioned, but I'm not going to give his name. Okay. Too many of you wouldn't believe me, and I've already lost happy anyway. I want to keep the rest of it to the service. Okay? Yeah. Listen, I'll just say this. I had to put up with all of the um, Christians running around for about five years telling me how Dr. Kissinger was going to be the Antichrist. I had to turn away and go, <laughs> because I knew better. Okay? But remember, what, who I'm saying it is doesn't mean that that's who it is. That just means that the Illuminati is going to do everything they can to make him the world ruler. Okay? But the way this country is going, and since Christians won't turn and seek the face of God and repent, and God can't save the country because they won't fulfill Second Chronicles, I would say he's probably going to be right on schedule. Yes, I had a, a question about your sister. You said that uh, she was more advanced in witchcraft than yourself. No. At, at, at one no. time? No, no. She she was given a position faster than I was. Faster That's than you Because were. women are given positions faster than men. Women, except in the higher councils, are the leaders. The high priest is in the coven, but he's only the enforcer. The high priest is, is the pastor. I see. Is she okay. still is she still in the cult? That was the first question. Yes, the other she one, is. She is. Okay. She's... she's one of Philip Rothschild's girlfriends, and she runs messages between Philip Rothschild and David Rockefeller on a regular basis. Okay. And the next question is, uh, you met your wife when she was a member of the cult, mm-hmm. and that must have been an awkward situation. Did you leave first, or did you leave she together? She my wife after she got saved. She took my sister's place as witch queen in the state of Ohio and owned the second largest occult store in the country, and she got saved in one of the meetings, and after going through rehabilitation and so on, we got married. Okay. And before you take any questions, let me do something here real quick. Because we're running out of time here. I spoke with your teenagers here at chapel, and I told them about a plan of the occult to place certain objects in Christians' homes to be able to put demonic influences into the home and tear down the home and the Christian prayer life and place rebellion and depression and suicide upon Christians. Now, you may think, well, I'm a Christian. That's impossible. Listen to me. When you take something that belongs to the devil into your possession, you're asking for trouble. All right? The Holy, the, the Bible, the Word of God was wholly inspired by the Holy Ghost. All right? Nobody, I think, will argue with me that's a born-again Christian, at least. Certain objects are inspired by the spirit of Satan, by demonic influence. Rock music. If witches can't cast spells on witches, they got, I mean, on, on Christians, they got smart. They'll let the Christians cast the spells on themselves. The witches will quote the spells in rock music, and they'll let the Christians play them, and they keep casting the spells over and over on themselves. That's why rock music. Now, you may think that's garbage, but the witches believe it, and I believe it, because I've seen it done. That's why rebellion and drugs and the sexual revolution has sweeped your children, and you try to shelter them from it by sending them to a Christian school, and then you let the world be brought into your homes in the form of rock music. But they didn't just want the kids. 
They wanted the adults. They pretty well got them with the soap operas. But they decided that they would put their most powerful object in witchcraft into the hands of Christians. First, they changed the names to make them look innocent. They didn't call them hexagrams and pentagrams and pentacles and leprechaun's horns and, and stuff like that anymore. They didn't call it the Ong or anything like that. They changed their name to things like just stars and, and crescents and crosses of lives so they could sell them in Christian bookstores and so on. In fact, that would probably surprise them that they would start selling them in Christian bookstores. They decided to sell them through their conglomerates first, and they used federal department stores, which owns most of the department stores that you ladies and gentlemen shop at. And the one that's not owned by federal department stores is Montgomery Wards, and it's owned by Standard Oil. So it's owned anyway. And then they wanted to go into all the rest of the homes that maybe wouldn't pick them up in the jewelry stores. So they used one of their largest companies. And if we have any distributors of this company I'm going to name, don't you come to me, because I've got a stack of testimony of how distributors... When they first started selling this, depression set in their home, their marriages broke up, and three or four people actually tried to take their own lives and fit the depression that they didn't understand. And these were born-again Christians. And then when they heard about this, they destroyed the stuff, and they've never had any of this in their home since. All the depression left, all the marriage troubles left, and the thoughts of suicide left. So I've got the testimony, so don't come and tell me about it. Those are the first three. Now this jewelry I'm going to show you, except the second two pieces, could not be bought in a store until a few years ago. You stop and think about it when you started seeing this stuff. To buy these symbols here, you had to go to a, a, an occult store. Of course, that was easy for San Francisco. They've always been a little weird. But you go to the occult stores, but you had to prove that you were initiated witch of a coven before they would sell this stuff to you, and it was made by their coven silversmith. The first one's called a pentacle. If you put a circle around it, it's called a pentagram. It's a symbol of witchcraft. And one point up is the symbol of witchcraft. Two points up, like it's showing kind of there, it's the symbol of Satanist church. The symbol of the horn god. You might also notice it's also the symbol of the eastern star. We were in San Francisco last night, and in the building that the Illuminati houses their, the Rothschild's private enforcer, Isaac Bonowitz, he's like a living computer, he's also one of the members of the council that I left, in the store down below, which sells many pieces of occult jewelry, they sell ladies' compacts with eastern stars embedded in them, with all the little runes and so on. This is called the hexagram, not the Star of David. The Star of David is a name change on it. David was dead and buried when that star was created by a son that had backslid and went into demonic worship. Solomon would seal his documents of war and his occult documents with that thing. They call it the Crest of Solomon or the hexagram. And that's where the word to hex or to cast an evil spell came from. Witches, when they conjure demons, they call the demons up to talk to them in person, this star must be drawn on the floor for the demon to arrive in or it won't appear. Now that gives you an idea. It's the most evil sign in the occult world. This symbol in various forms means that you're an initiated witch of witchcraft. And if you'll watch television, boy, well, I'm sure you do. If you watch television you'll notice that many of the television stars are now wearing this symbol openly. Why not? Christians don't know what it means. you also notice it was a sign of the Shriners, too. This one up above is being sold. Well, well, this one. Oh, well. Somehow, there we go. Let me get out. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work. There we go. There, we got it worked out. The first one's called the Ankh. They call it the Cross of Life now. It's done in Christian bookstores and so on. The Cross of Life or the Ankh comes from Egypt. It means that you're a worshiper of Ra, the sun god. That's the Egyptian name for Lucifer. So it means that you worship Lucifer. It means that you despise virginity, that you're against virginity, that you practice orgies, and that you believe in reincarnation. That means that you don't believe in heaven or hell, that when you die you're going to come back again, and the word of God is a lie because it says you'll live once and then judgment. But they say no. The next is the broken cross. The peace sign. It didn't originate in Frisco or London during the peace movement. It's been around a long time. We've heard a lot of cracks about it, you know, the footprint of American chicken and all this type of thing. This is what it is. When a member wants to be, when a person wants to become a member of witchcraft and they come from a Christian background, I didn't have to take this initiation because I was born into witchcraft. They're given a cross made out of ceramic clay, you know, baked clay, 
and it's turned upside down, and they take the crossbars, and they break it, forcing the crossbars down and break the crossbars off. And they throw the pieces to the floor and shatter it. And the priest or priestess, whoever's doing the initiation, then announces, you are free from the bondage of the Christian church, and because of this act, you shall have peace evermore. Thus, the peace sign. It's called the broken cross. This one you're not going to find until about a year from now. Anybody ever seen this symbol before? Everybody wants six, 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 six. You're right. Six, six, six. It's three overlapping sixes. Okay, here's where you can find it. You can find it on the world currency printed out of Brussels. We bought ten billion dollars of it, but our president decided that it's better to go with the credit card than the currency now, so we're not going to use it. You'll find it in clothing and shoes made in the common market countries, in the labels of the clothing. More recent, about a year ago, it was on national television, when the President of the United States, you know, the peanut eater from Georgia, well, I mean, you know, I'm, that's about the best I can do for him. I could say more. said he had personally designed a national security card that would be the answer to the problems in the United States. And that every citizen, law-abiding citizen, would have one of these cards to prove they were a law-abiding citizen. You know, whatever. And then, he got done making his speech, he left, his press secretary came up and says to the newsman, here's a picture. Now, for some reason, with all the flashballs popping and stuff, that card, this picture, never got printed in the paper. I don't know why. Maybe they decided it was a bad move. But in the center of the card was a pearl white glossy card, computer plastic type. In the center, in kind of a gray, with words written over it, you know, but in the background, you know, like a watermark, was this emblem. Welcome to the last generation. They're putting their forces together. Now, the California National Guard has switched to this patch recently. It, there's a circle with three arrows coming out of it on their behalf. We've known that Florida, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and about six other states have switched to it this year. We've been told by the end of the year that all the National Guard in the United States will wear one patch. They've all, at the first of this year, were hooked into a computer in Dallas called the National Security Computer. That's who they call up, by the way, when they check out your Visa cards or your Bank of America cards or whatever the case may be. Now, if you've been going to the grocery stores and the department stores, you've been noticing the new computer cash registers. The, you know, one shopping step type cash registers and you put your card in it, ring up the purchase and it does all the business for you right then and there. Well, all the stores are supposed to switch over to them, and the little poor stores are supposed to get the little phone unit that hooks into your phone, and you zip the card through. This is all supposed to happen in the next year, right on time schedule, just like it should be. Then, things will be a little different around here, because by then they plan on destroying the money that you have. And then you'll have to use the card, because the money will be worthless. Now, if you think, if you've been noticing all the television commercials, Security is the word that everybody's been using on television commercials. Prepare for the future. Pack up for security this and security that. And then they're going to turn around and they're going to wipe your security off the face of the man. I'm going to destroy that microphone before it's over. Now, if I'm stepping on your little safe world, I'm sorry. I'm trying to tell you something in advance. I'm going to give you a reading list so you don't think I'm the only nut in the world. The first book is None Dare Call Conspiracy. I'm going to give these quick and then I'll take a few questions. We've got a few minutes and that's it. The next is the Rockefeller Files. And the last one is Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter. Now, those can be found in most bookstores. They're by Gary Allen. But I recommend one that you find in the Christian bookstore. It's called The Day the Dollar Dies. You might decide to invest the financial money that you're saving in your savings account that will be worthless before this year is out in the work of God. I'm serious. It will be worthless before this year is out. This time next year, the time schedule they have, I'll give you a few events. I'm not prophesying, I'm giving you physical knowledge. You may think I'm crazy. They thought I was crazy back in 1972 when I said we were going to have a fuel shortage. They thought I was crazy back in 1973 when I said watch for the coal mines to close. So you may think I'm crazy, but next year when it's all happening, at least I told you in advance. You got a little bit of warning. There'll be 10 million people out of work this time next year. Now that's when our welfare system, unemployment system, the social security system goes collapse because it won't be able to handle that many people out of work. And you may want to go home and pray and ask yourself what this country is going to be like with 10 million people not eating and not having any money. 
And then you may want to pray that a lot of souls get one and Jesus comes quickly. I know I'm going to. Okay, I'll take some questions and answers. Let's just go without the microphone so we can do it quickly, and I'll, I'll try to repeat the question. <laughs> I believe you. Go ahead. I, silver and gold coins, and, and uh, I forget the South African coin, and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah, huh? Cougar Ant. Okay. Real quickly. I heard everybody in the world described as the Antichrist. That's why I'm not giving my opinion along with it. Okay? Yes, I've heard about him. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about him. And as for your silver and gold coins, okay, how are you going to spend them if you're not allowed to spend them? You understand what I'm trying to say? Okay. All the silver and gold in the world, you're right. You do have the right idea. The only system that will exist then is either the government no-cash system or a barter system between people, okay? That's why people like Tom Berry, myself, Joe Boyd, and other ministers across the country are now telling people to prepare for a barter system, okay? You can make it to the Lord comes on the barter system. But gold and silver is the wrong way to go, okay? I take your gold and silver if you've got it stored up and invest it in the barter system real quick. Because even if you could spend gold and silver, okay, the barter system would still work even better. Because they've got to have goods. The number one most valuable item will be one that is illegal and almost impossible to obtain at the time, called a firearm, a gun. The next will be ammunition to go in that gun, and then dehydrated and freeze-dried food, or canned goods. Okay? Well, water will probably be the most expensive item in existence. Okay? They've got a few surprises for the drinking system that you now have. Okay? Next question. Back here. All the way in the back. Do you? Yeah. Yes, he is. Is the Antichrist in politics was the question? Yes, he is. Yes, he's in American politics. Yes. Well, we've won quite a few Jehovah Witnesses. I'm not saying that this will win them, but you could try one question. It usually starts the ball rolling. What tribe are you a member of? You'd have to understand their doctrine, but it really starts with stuttering and stammering. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm against the Catholic Church for one reason, okay? It's because when I was in, well, it's two reasons. When I was in the Catholic Church, the occult world received a sanction from Pope Paul that white witchcraft was permissible for Catholics to practice. And second, I can watch Catholic Mass. I can go in and write our Masses down, our rites in witchcraft, and let you read them as they go through them in the Catholic Church. Most, most, of, most of the doctrine, the doctrine of the saints, the doctrine of the mighty ones in witchcraft. The doctrine of the wine being turned to blood, that's in witchcraft. Okay? Uh, the doctrine almost of everything, the altar, the minus the knife, is the only thing missing on the Catholic altar from the witchcraft altar. And in some countries, not America, the, the, not the knife, but the scourge, which is also on the uh, witchcraft altar, is laid on the Catholic altar. And most of all the doctrines, the doctrines of the, the virgins, the, the nuns, the doctrines of the priesthood, and, and so these are all come from the temples of Diana in Rome and were invested into the Christian church at the Nicene Council. Okay? It was back when the witches got smart. They said, if we can't beat them, we'll join them. And they've been doing it ever since. Yes. Well, there's a book coming out. Okay? Called The Angel of Light. All right? And in it, it compares the Mormons, the Masonic, and the witchcraft doctrines. And they're almost all three. They're like triplets, okay? It'll be from Chick Publications in the form of the Crusader comic books, and it'll be out in about two months when the artwork's done. Watch your Christian bookstore for it. I got a feeling it's going to win more Masons and more Mormons out of the occult world than anything has ever done before. Because it quotes from some of the most inner books of the Mormons and Masons. The problem with the Mormons and Masons is they live on that secrecy thing. You never know what the inner circles are doing. So this book brings the inner circles to the outer circle. And boy, it's going to open some eyes, too. I want to see the Masons stutter and stammer around when they read out of their own books that Jesus Christ is the God of evil and Lucifer is the God of good. And then I want them to tell me that the Masons are a Christian organization. Yes? I can't hear you. What happens after the second plane when a so-called 
You mean the Salem witchcraft trial? Okay, there's another book coming out from Chick Publications as soon as the Angel of Light gets out. It'll be out in about a year if the world hangs around that long. And it's called Mancho, and it's on the Salem Witchcraft Trials. Now, I went back there because my family, the Collins family, is credited of building the Salem Church, building the building. So I went back there, and I kind of conned myself in, half prayer, half conning, into the Ethics Museum Library where the original manuscripts are. And I went through the original manuscripts, except for one prostitute. Every person executed in the Salem Witch Trials was not a Puritan, but a born-again Christian. They were from a group across the river that had separated from the Puritan church, and the pastor there was preaching the born-again experience. And that this one thing that would upset a witch, having a bunch of freaky Christians next door to him. So they hung him. Considering the pastor wasn't a pastor that, that had the Salem church, he was a slave trader. That's a matter of history. The Collins had built the church, and it was the first American witchcraft coven. So why were they going to hang real witches? Of course not. And it comes out really plain. And one of the main charges was that the Christians across the river were reading from the book of Revelation, and that was against the law. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't know it was that sloppy. Uh, and another, uh, my boy went to your, went to your uh, meeting on this Friday, and he spoke to you and take part of your back by the case. Mark, you did. Those are good questions. One, I'm packing a weapon because I've had so many attempts on my life. Okay? I don't, I know some Christians can't understand a Christian having a weapon. The same Christians have never had their families and themselves shot at dozens of times. I've got a wife and children and myself, and I might as well go ahead and stay at the refuge house the way that those people are going to stay alive, because the workers all pack weapons within the house. Now, before that was done, we had one other refuge house. Three people were machine gunned to death in the house. That's why I pack a weapon. Okay? Next, I don't, I all the laws of California. The weapon's on me when I'm in the church. When I leave, it goes in the trunk of my car. Okay? But uh, we take so many different routes, <laughs> they're going to have a hard time finding me when I leave the church. Now... I want to go up with this a little more and then I'll ask you your other question. There are many ministers today that are packing guns, all contracts in their life, all well-known ministers. One of the most well-known ministers in the country today is Jack Howes. Jack probably won't win when he's here. He'll trust the churches to have security for him while he's here. We had to when he was down at our home church a couple of weeks ago. In fact, several of the people that are guarding me today guarded Brother Howes as bodyguards when he was there. But he preaches behind a bulletproof podium and two bodyguards escort him all over the place when he's in Hammond. There's been that many attempts on his life. Tom Berry, Joe Boyd, they go armed all the time. Okay? Now, Chip Publications, after doing The Broken Cross, the book that I wrote, had to move into a building with bulletproof glass in the windows. And when you drive up to the building, you'll still see the bullet holes in the windows where they tried to go ahead and shoot them anyway through the windows. Now, that is the real world out there when you start dealing with the occult. Next... The human sacrifice thing, I did. I went, gave all the information to the FBI. I told them what senators were involved. I mean, the man who handed me the knife to do the ritualistic killing was a United States senator that ran for president named McGovern. I gave the times, the dates. I said where weapons are stored. Now, this will give you an idea. Right now, and we have one witness back here who saw several trucks with thousands of machine guns and thousands of grenades unloaded two weeks ago in a storage place five miles from our home church up to Panga Canyon. We notified the alcohol, tobacco, farms, the county sheriff, and the local police. It's still there, with more weapons being moved in every day. When we told the FBI, I had four ministers with me. They said, well, for turning this information in, and they didn't give it to me in writing, you have community and all this, and they walked out, you know, we walked out, and oh, good, we're really going to do something for the Illuminati. We can just see McGovern walking in the handcuffs. Called back two weeks later, they denied they ever talked to us. Now, that's the real world, okay? Now, if it happened to the... Several times they've tried to get, get grand juries. We try to get grand juries going. And all the only person they ever wanted to indict was me. So we've now learned that if they ever try to do that again, when we go in, we just bring a lawyer along with us. I don't mind going down, you know, uh, as long as the Illuminati goes with it. But they won't. Because you're talking about presidents and senators and FBI agents and everything else. I turned down preaching in a church in this area because two FBI agents were present. Nothing against the pastor or the congregation, because it has a fine reputation as a church. I wouldn't go there for that reason, because two years ago, we tried to get a grand jury, a federal grand jury, to indict two FBI agents that were spotted by dozens of people 
openly trying to kill me, shooting at me, almost at point blank range. Guess what happened? Nothing. Okay. Next question. One more question. Way in the back. <laughs> What do you call? Oh, okay, I'll give you a bombshell you're not going to believe. Kennedy got uh, saved three months before his death. That's why they killed him. Okay, I can take about ten minutes, but I don't want to, to explain and prove that, it ha- that that's the truth. But it did happen. In fact, several people, if they were there last night, I went into detail about it. Okay, but it did happen. He was saved down in Tampa, Florida, uh, through a man that helped arrange the Bay of Pigs that became a Christian a few months earlier, and then witnessed to him along with a couple ministers, and he gave his heart to the Lord. And they tried to call him back. The Pope even ordered him into a private audience a month before his death and ordered him to take Mass. And Kennedy walked out of the place refusing Mass. The lady might give that to her husband. Okay? But that's why. Okay, Pastor, it's all yours. All right, I need some help up here. Dan, perhaps a couple of you fellas can remove some of this and bring the pulpit up here. We appreciate your, your kind attention. And I realize there's still a lot of questions that, that you have. This is uh, not the typical church service that we've, we've had, but we feel that God's people need to be made aware of some of these things that are taking place.